Okay, Rico Rocks 2001 here making this introduction to both my Super Nintendo and Super Famicom uh, disassembly video. And I just want to point out, if you're taking apart a Super Nintendo, Super Famicom, or even the PAL Super Nintendo, basically the inner motherboards are very similar. It just depends on which model do you have. Do you have the original launch model with the removable sound chip, the later ones with the soldered onto the board, the later ones with a small cheaper chips to put one giant chip and one small chip as well as a soldered in cartridge connector with stuff like that because every later model the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom they do cost reduction to the motherboard and uh, you know how it goes anyway so I just want to throw that out basically while the shells are completely different between the American design and the international designs the, Europe, the PAL region got the same design. The only difference is between this and the PAL one is this would say Super Nintendo Entertainment System just like that, but more blackish. And it would have the Nintendo Oval logo that everybody knows and loves. And the cartridge connect or the cartridge door would say a PAL version instead of use cassettes with Super Famicom mark only. So without further ado, let's go ahead and strip one of these two apart. Now, the American Super Nintendo, this one basically has six screws underneath to take it apart. There are game bits. You'll need a special screwdriver to open them up. Or you could try the big pen trick, which I don't recommend. It's your choice if you want to do that or not. Once you get those six screws out, you can easily lift off the top part of the case. Although I should warn you, sometimes the controller ports, depending on if they're yellowed or not, likes to stick around on the lid. I've had a another Super Nintendo done that before in the original launch 1990 Super Nintendo. This is a 1993 model, I should mention, because the 1993 models, this has a raised plastic instead of the usual screen printed eject button. Also, the motherboard is much smaller. On the original 1990 launch models, well, actually 91 in America, but same idea. There's an extra sound module that has two screws right there. Well, right here and right there. And the motherboard is right up down towards here, right where my finger is. This one, basically, you only have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine screws holding the motherboard. You would have an extra four, that would make it 13 on the original Super Nintendo, if anyone's wondering. Also, when you take those screws out, these two, the these two, and that are the same length. But these two and the ones holding the power adapter and the RF and AV are completely different, but these two are the same as those, so if you mix those four up, you shouldn't have a problem. To remove also, something else I'd like to point out, later Super Nintendos, if anyone's wondering why this is not there, because these later Super Nintendos do not need that big cap, like the launch models. So if anyone's wondering or complaining that, oh, mine doesn't have that, you don't need it. It's not necessary. But if you want to add it there, be my guest, but I wouldn't recommend it. The capacitor right there is what I'm talking about. To remove one of these, basically, you lift this portion there. Earlier ones, there, it'd be bent right here and not straight. And then you can take out your eject button. On American Super Nintendo, it's a whole piece, not two separate pieces, just like the other Super Nintendos and Super Famicoms released worldwide. And this portion is different. This side's short, this side is long. So when you put this back on, you want to be sure the short side goes right there, and the long one goes down there. Also when you take off all the screws. On the earlier Super Nintendos from 1990, you would have to disconnect the controller ports to get access to the motherboard. This one, you don't need to do that. So I'll do a jump cut and take all the screws out. Okay, I took out all the screws. Once you take out the screws for the power switch, you can move it to the side, or you can disconnect it like this. You can easily disconnect the power connector like that. Let's say this one is corroded. You can swap it with a one that's not corroded and then it will power on just fine. And on the board, basically, let's go ahead and lift off this uh, metal shielding. And underneath, you have a 1993 model Super Nintendo. 
This is a 1993 model. Some guy who did a region free Super Nintendo, that being the Damo Mosh there. Basically, he had the same motherboard that I have, except his was one of those later ones that you cannot remove the cartridge connector. This one, boom. You take this off, and you can swap it with another one. I hate those later ones that you have to desolder from the bottom to get this portion off. These earlier ones are way better, in my opinion. Anyway, I also took the three screws in the back off, and then I lift this off, and voila! You could also disconnect this controller port ribbon cable, but like I should point out, you should be very careful when removing it because these pin or these ribbon cables end up getting damaged a lot, and you'd have to scavenge one from a, another Super Nintendo or Super Famicom. Also, the controller port spacing is different than the other consoles from the Super Famicom and PAL Super Nintendo. So if you want to use accessories like the uh, a, uh, the I heard Acclaim, oh yeah, Acclaim was the one who made the wireless dual turbo controller. They basically made it for the American Super Nintendo. You can also take that portion right off. This one would take a screw. Um, but there you have it. That's the bottom portion of the American Super Nintendo. At least the 1992 to 90s so and so models until the mini came out. The ones from 1994 to 96 have are slightly shorter than this, and they have smaller chips, I should point out. But this disassembly video will work on all of them. Just remember the two screws right there and right there for the uh, 1990 models that have the removable soundboard. Here's the Super Nintendo motherboard right there. You've got your chips right there, some region lockout chip, um, your cartridge connector, that, which is removable on these models. Some later 1993 models do not have removable motherboard or removable cartridge connectors. There's your Pico fuse, your voltage regulator, and on the back your um, power AV and RF. And now let's go ahead and reassemble this. Now before you put it back all together, I recommend basically hooking up the wires, the controller, and the AC adapter and AV cables. Unlike the International Super Famicom and PAL Super Nintendo, the AC adapter, you can only fit the official Nintendo one there. You can buy generic Yobo AC adapters. They're not too bad. So I recommend getting an official Nintendo AC adapter for the Super Nintendo. Also, good luck trying to find uh, something else that would fit into these kind because when Nintendo designed the Super Nintendo in America, they had a weird, they basically made a dumb design for a uh, plug because these uh, barrel designs break easily. For the AV cables, you can use any AV cable, whether it's N64, GameCube, or off of a Super Famicom or AV Famicom, stuff like that. They all have the same connector that plugs in the back right there. Let's go ahead and fire on Tetris Attack, also known as Penalty Pawn in Japan. You can use American or Japanese controllers on here. In fact, I'm using both an American and Japanese controller. Here they are side by side. This is a later Super Nintendo controller from 1997 with the Nintendo logo instead of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. I couldn't find my original one, but Believe me, most people have seen their original Super Nintendo controller. This is the Japanese Super Famicom with the color buttons, which I prefer compared to the ugly lavender and purple. Okay, they're not that ugly, but this looks more appealing to the eye. Though, the concave is a nice addition, to be honest. But the I really like the red, blue, yellow, and green more. So, let's go ahead and test out some Tetris Attack and go ahead and select a two-player mode to show that this is working. I have it set to, basically, you got your characters. In Panel de Pawn, basically, all the characters' levels are similar, except um, instead of having Yoshi, you have um, you have Lip and a bunch of other characters representing each world. You would have, basically, the Sky World, Ice World, Jungle, but Flutter was supposed to be an underground level in the original water level, fire, another water level, uh, 
the dark. And the bosses are completely different in the Japanese Penalty Pond. These three have the same music as the first two bosses in um, Penalty Pond. But Bowser has the second to final boss music for um, Penalty Pond. The final boss actually has completely different music in Penalty Pond. They have better music than the music that we got for our final boss. I kind of wish we had the actual final boss music. And I think Kamek should have been the final boss instead of Bowser. That's just my opinion. Anyway, let's go ahead and select two different characters. Um, also, it's, they basically changed music for Yoshi compared to Lips theme, which is completely different. Let's go ahead and select... Um, I'm going to select Bowser and Kamek. And show some gameplay on how Tetris Attack works. And Penalty Pawn, which is the Japanese equivalent to this game. Basically, the object is to send blocks to your opponent. Now, here's a perfect example. Oh, I was wrong. Oh, well, I'll figure out something. Ah, here we go. Boom. Basically, you send blocks to your opponents. The bigger the chains are, the bigger the blocks will be. And you get the point. The first one to really reach the top basically loses, and the other person gets a point. If you're playing story mode, basically, if you beat the boss or the opponent, you move on to the next level. But if you fail, you basically get a game over continue screen. Tetris Attack is a very fun game. I totally recommend it. So anyway, I should probably put this back together. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Also, one more thing I'd like to point out is on the American Super Nintendo compared to the PAL Super Nintendo and Japanese Super Famicom, putting the rod in is somewhat more challenging with the American Super Nintendo because on this one, this side's short, this one's long. Unlike the other ones where both of them are the same size, basically. So you want to be sure that the short end goes in the one at the top and the long one goes at the one at the bottom. And also later Super Nintendo's, this one does not have that little curve on there, so putting them in is much more challenging. You want to be sure this rod goes into that hole right there. And this big hole goes right, or this spot goes in the big hole right there. So you want to be sure this goes in properly like this. And um, I'm going to try to do it diagonally so I can get in successfully to show you what I mean. Sometimes you'd have to do this off camera and I really don't want to... Oh, I almost got it. I almost got it. Ah, hey, there we go. Wow, that wasn't as challenging as I thought it would be. It actually went better than I hoped for. So when you got that in, test out the eject button, press it down to see if it works. And then there you go. And when you're finished basically having all the screws and stuff back together, you can put the lid back on and then basically re-screw it back together. There you have it. That's basically putting, taking apart and putting a Super Nintendo back together. Anyway, thanks for watching and hope you like this video.